We are now going to take a close look at what is called the post Maurya period in Indian history. What do we mean by this expression post Maurya period? It is obviously after the collapse of the Maurya dynasty around 187-185 BC. If we, for the sake of convenience, try to begin our survey 15 years ahead of this date, say from 200 BC, then the beginning of the post Maurya period can start from around 200 BC and we would like to end around AD 300, that is a period of five centuries. We would like to take a close look not only at the political powers, which are many, but also at the social economic developments, the cultural scenario, including what was happening in the field of religious beliefs, practices, in field of literary creations and also in the visual arts. Gone is the existence of a pan-Indian or nearly pan-Indian power like the Mauryas. Now political scene is dominated by a very large number of powers of different strengths stretching from the farthest borderland of the subcontinent, the northwestern part of the subcontinent, down to the deep south of the subcontinent. There are, interestingly, many non-indigenous powers, the Greeks, the Shakas, the Pallavas and the mighty Kushanas dominating different stretches of the northwestern frontier area and also parts of the northern plains of India, partly also the western Indian area. The period of 500 years is no less significant for the unprecedented contacts, commercial as well as cultural contacts of the subcontinent with widespread areas beyond the subcontinent like Central Asia, West Asia, the Mediterranean, particularly the Eastern Mediterranean region. In terms of cultural activities, the period left its marks in the form of major literary creations and fascinating developments in visual arts. For the first time, peninsular part of India comes into prominence in politics, in social and economic developments and also in terms of the creation of visual arts. Therefore, the period is a complex one. To understand this complexity of this period, the sources are also diverse and complex. There are large number of inscriptions, varieties of coins struck in different types of metals, varieties of texts written by both Indians as well as non-Indian authors including authors in Greek, Latin and Chinese languages. We shall also use the earliest texts written in Tamil language. Along with that, we have field archaeological evidence and also the use of visual materials to understand cultural and social economic life. Let us begin to have a look at the most apparent change that is in the arena of politics. The beginning of the post Maurya period of course marks the end of the Maurya period in the hands of Pushyamitra Sunga, the former commander-in-chief Senapati of the Mauryas. He overthrew the last Maurya ruler and established in Pataliputra Shunga dynasty. Of course, Pushyamitra Sunga was the founder of this dynasty. The Puranas mention several of his successors. Their historicity is difficult to establish. Only one successor of Pushyamitra Sunga, Dhanadeva, who was sixth in line of descent from the founder of this dynasty is known from an inscription from Ayodhya. In fact, this late ruler Dhanadeva remembers his 
grand ancestor, the founder of the dynasty, Pushyamitra Sunga, as a performer of two horse sacrifices, Ashwamedha Yajna, against whom did he fight? That history is not very clearly known. But if we combine the evidence of the famous grammatical treaties, the Mahabhashya Patanjali, who was Pushyamitra's contemporary, and a Puranic text called Yuga Purana, it appears that Pushyamitra had to face, soon after the accession to the throne, the threat of the invasion of the Yavanas from the northwest. Who are these Yavanas? The Yavanas actually denote the Greek rulers from Bactria, that is the area of northeastern Afghanistan. They crossed the Hindu Kush, swooped down onto the plains of the Punjab, and according to the two literary texts we have mentioned, they threatened areas in the Ganga Valley like Saketa, which is close to Ayodhya, area around Kusumadhwaja or perhaps Pataliputra. They also swooped down upon Madhyamika, that is the region of Chitor. Pushyamitra Sunga, according to a late text, the famous drama of Kalidasa, Malavikagni Mitram, defeated with the help of his grandson, Agnimitra, the Yavana raiders, and perhaps that required the performance of two horse sacrifices. The control of the Shungas was over greater parts of the Ganga Valley. If we believe the story of Malavika Agnimitram, then we can assume that Pushyamitra Sunga had some authority also over the region of Eastern Malawa. After this came another dynasty called the Kanvas. We are not going to pay a detailed look at this particular dynasty. The Kanvas, according to the Puranic list of rulers, had four rulers. They ruled for 45 years only. We have come now at this juncture in the second half of the first century BC. At this point of time emerged a new power in Kalinga. For the first time Kalinga emerges in Indian history as a powerful political entity. The author of this change in the political position of Kalinga, which means the coastal part of Orissa and the eastern part of Orissa, mainly along the Mahanadi Valley and the Mahanadi Delta. The ruler is Kharavela, who belongs to the Chedi or the Mahamegavahana dynasty. He is known only from inscriptions and particularly a very long eulogy, Prashasti type of inscription written in Prakrit, which is available in the Hatigumpha cave near present-day Bhuvaneshwar. This Prashasti type of inscription at Hatigumpha gives a very graphic account of the life and achievements of Kharavela, who was the third ruler of the Mahameghavahana dynasty. He is praised as a devout Jaina ruler, but that did not deter him from launching a series of campaigns and conquests which are enlisted almost year by year after he ascended the throne. Now when did Karavela rule? One passage in this inscription reads that he probably came to rule after 300 years have elapsed from the rule of a Nanda king. If we remember the Nandas, their rule cannot be 
placed anything later than 325 BC. So, if the Kalinga ruler Karavela was 300 years later than the Nanda ruler, you cannot find this ruler in Kalinga before 25 or 30 BC. The inscription remembers in glowing terms his many conquests at least twice to Magadha, to Anga which is eastern Bihar. He once sent his armies without ever taking into consideration a ruler called Satakarni, possibly a Satavahana ruler about whom we shall talk about later. This Satakarni ruler according to Karavela's statement ruled to the west of his kingdom. If he was ruling in Kalinga, the western area is the area around Maharashtra. So, he possibly went into Maharashtra. There are lists of conquests of this ruler into the region of what he calls Bharatavasa in Prakrit, which means Bharatavarsha. Obviously, the ruler of Kalinga was not conquering the whole of Bharatavarsha that is India. This is the earliest known use of the term Bharatavarsha or Bharatavasa in an inscription which actually means an area located in the Ganga valley located between Magadha on the east and possibly Mathura in the west. Apart from the conquests and campaigns he led in the Ganga valley, he also launched campaigns successful military campaigns in the southern part that is the peninsular part of India in a region called Pithunda which is in the coastal area of Andhra possibly in the Godavari delta area. Here we can see how he is pushing his military campaigns from the Mahanadi delta into the Godavari delta. He is also credited with a major campaign against a collection of Tamil rulers that is even going farther south into the Tamilakam area. There is a description that he defeated even a ruler of the Pandya country which is in the Vaigai valley around present day Madurai region in Tamil Nadu. Now, this is a very far flung military campaign. These campaigns were largely in the form of raids to capture booties, to establish himself as a very powerful conqueror and this led the rise of Kalinga in the second half of the first century BC. He was not succeeded by a number of capable and powerful successors and the Mahavegavahana dynasty in Kalinga actually uh, went out of our gaze soon after the end of this ruler's reign. We actually do not know how long the Mahavegavahana ruler Karavela actually was on the throne. The northwestern part of the subcontinent is even more complex and has a very large number of rulers, many of whom came from outside India, largely from Central Asia and West Asiatic background. We would like to turn our attention to them now. The first two take into account in this context are the Greek rulers in the northwestern borderland of the subcontinent also pushing into the northern plains of the subcontinent. These Greek rulers are usually known in Indian 
sources, the indigenous sources as the Yavanas. This was well worked out by a scholar named James Mishiner, who particularly analyzed the content of the Yuga Purana and indicated how the Yavana rulers tried to infiltrate into the North Indian plains. But where did they come from? For this, we have to go outside the subcontinent to the region of Bactria. Now, Bactria holds and will hold in course of our discussion a very crucial position in understanding the politics of North India and particularly North India's intimate linkage with the northwestern borderland of the subcontinent. In the hoary antiquity, there was no such frontier, no such borderland of the subcontinent with the neighboring areas of West Asia and Central Asia. In this, the position of Afghanistan is of crucial significance, particularly its northern part stands almost at the crossroads. In Bactria, we knew that the Seleucid Greek rulers were ruling for a long time. Their contacts with the Mauryas are well known. About 230 BC, a Greek subordinate ruler in Bactria decided to overthrow his allegiance to the Seleucidian overlord and made himself master of Bactria, which with its capital at Bactra, that is present day Mazar e Sharif in Afghanistan. That began the presence of, the political presence of the Bactrian Greek rulers. These Bactrian Greek rulers have been researched in very great details by W. W. Tarn in his The Greeks in Bactria and India. It is about these Greek rulers that the Puranic texts possibly mentioned about the Yavana invasion. The two principal conquerors from the Bactrian Greek side are Euthydemus and Demetrius. Possibly they invaded the northern part of the subcontinent at the time when Pushyamitra Sunga had come to the throne, that is, by the first quarter of the second century BC. The Bactrian Greeks pushed down obviously through the northwestern frontier area that is the Gandhar area consisting of the Peshawar Rawalpindi region lying both to the west of the Indus and the east of the Indus. Then on to the region of the Punjab plains, Punjab both of present day Pakistan and of India and then into the Indo-Ganga divide the Ganga Yamuna Dwab and possibly even threatened the Magadhan capital of Shungas located in Pataliputra that is present a part. The Puranas give a hint in the form of a pseudo prophecy that the Yavana rulers though initially very successful militarily would not be able to consolidate their military victories into territorial expansion because in their own land that is Bahalika or Bactria region there would be trouble and they would have to go back leaving their political ambitions unfulfilled in the Indian mainland area. It, the Puranic description has some relevance. At this time there was once again an internal squabble, a revolt in Bactria. The political battle for control over Bactria and also over the Greek position in the northwestern borderland led to a virtual division among the Bactrian Greeks. One group of rulers 
began to rule in the borderland area, the frontiers of northwestern frontiers of the subcontinent, essentially into the Indian mainland area, they would be considered as the Indo-Greeks. The well-known historian A. K. Narayan made a very detailed study of the Indo-Greek rulers. They would be held distinct from their counterparts who continued their political stronghold in Bactria proper, that is the region around Balkh, the present day Mazar-e Sharif, the region into of Afghanistan and Kabul region. This is the area of what is called the Bactrian Greeks, distinct from the Indo-Greeks, whose base of power was essentially in the northwestern frontier areas, the Gandhara area and then into Punjab of the Indian subcontinent. So by Greeks, we are actually looking at the Bactrian Greeks and also the Indo-Greeks. These rulers are mostly known by their coins. They issued excellent coins, mostly in silver, with beautiful figures of the ruler, almost like a sculpted figure in very high relief and with full title of the Greek rulers engraved on the principal side of the coin, which is called the obverse side. On the reverse side, we often find images of different deities and along with the names of the ruler in Greek language and Greek script, we find also in the coin the legend in Prakrit language and in Karushti and Brahmi scripts. The use of this bilingual inscriptions and messages in their coins very clearly suggests that these Greek rulers had to do something politically at least with the Indian subcontinent, particularly the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent where Prakrit language was in currency rather than their own mother tongue Greek. Of the rulers who rule from the Indian mainland, a very prominent figure is Minander, who is famous in the Indian textual tradition as Milinda. He is the ruler according to the Milinda Paiha, the questions of Milinda, who was converted to Buddhism by a Buddhist Acharya, a teacher, Nagasena. Minander or Milinda figures very prominently as a powerful Greek ruler ruling over different parts of Gandhara and also over parts of Punjab as his coins would indicate. The Greek rule in the northwestern part of the subcontinent is largely known, let us repeat, from the evidence of coins. Inscriptions play a relatively lesser role in reconstructing their history. Apart from Minander, at least one ruler in 2nd century BC around the region of Gandhara, particularly Taxila, Takshashila of the ancient time is known as Antialkidas. He sent his ambassador and envoy Heliodorus to a ruler in Vidisha. The position of the Greek rulers in Bactria Prat particularly was threatened by a very peculiar development that took place far away from the, cent from the Indian subcontinent. But such a development took place in the steppe areas of Central Asia. Many of the events that appeared in the plains of North India had almost their origin in the far away steppe lands of Central Asia where existed a number of nomadic 
groups, these nomadic groups were fierce warriors. About them we know from very ancient Chinese sources. We also know them from the Greek accounts. Why in Greek accounts and why in Chinese accounts? The Chinese Han dynasty felt always at unease from the depredations of the Central Asiatic nomadic warrior groups. Similarly, the Greek rule in Bactria was considerably threatened by the warlike movements of such nomadic groups. And that's why both these sources record the role of these nomadic groups. We know from the Chinese texts that the Greek rule in Bactria came to an end. In fact, it was terminated about 130 BC, 125 BC by several such nomadic groups. One of the nomadic groups, warlike nomadic groups was the Shakas, the Scythians or the Scythians known as Shakas in Indian sources and also the Iwechi or the Da Iwechi from whom we would see later the Kushanas. How did the Shakas and the Iwechis brought an end to the Greek rule in Bactria and also that led to their conflict with the Greek rulers on the in subcontinent's mainland we shall gradually see. It is likely that in course of their westward movements from the Central Asian steppe area, they reached the region of Bactria and put an end to the long existence of the Greek presence, the Greek rulers in Bactria. And from there, they possibly came to Kabul, from Kabul to Peshawar, Peshawar to Taxila, and then from Taxila into the plains of the Punjab. But if we take a close look at the Chinese sources, the Shaka raiders could have also approached the subcontinent through what is called the Jibin or Chipin route. This is the route through the northernmost part of Kashmir from Central Asia. And this is in fact a shortcut and possibly by these two routes the Shaka raiders penetrated into the subcontinent.